I'm Carl King. Can you believe it? In this lost episode, I talk with Mark Borchart, the subject of my favorite documentary of all time, American Movie. This was recorded in June 2014 at Bell Sound Studios when Mark was out here in Hollywood for a film. My previous podcast was discontinued due to imaginary city difficulties, so I'm releasing the episode now. Listening back to this, I'm a bit embarrassed at how intimidated I was by him. His answers and reactions really threw me off a few times, so much that I even edited out a few of my derailments. Of course, Mark is one of my creative folk heroes, but normally I can handle interviewing anyone. As you will hear, he is highly intelligent and charismatic, and in my defense, I was on a high dose of SSRIs at the time for acute anxiety. It did have a severe sedating effect on me, and I can even hear it in my voice, as I was quite low energy and talking very slow. Side note, Mark coincidentally appears on my latest record, Grand Architects of the Universe, which you can find on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Bandcamp, and my own shop. And if you want to help fund my creative projects like this podcast, please head over and join my Patreon for $5 a month or $1 a month, $20 a month at patreon.com slash carlking. Here today with Mark Borchart. Excellent. Thank you for having me, Carl. And uh, right off the bat, I was blown away by your prodigious realm. You had handed me a DVD of your feature film. And not only that, to a top it, actually, you handed me your book. <laughs> and I'll have you sign it after this show. And as I was talking to you before we got on the air, that I would immediately begin reading it actually for a couple reasons for one so it doesn't begin to collect dust among thousands of other books but also in honor of your immediate spirit not only of kindness but also of your incredible work output you know just to honor what you've done in life so thank you you're kind of a hard guy to read i mean i i can't i can't read you right off the bat a lot of people uh you know they're uh personalities are kind of you, you can kind of read them on the surface and you it's there's i, I don't know I, I you're you're a little hard to read well i'm most likely some sort of borderline autistic uh asperger's syndrome or something mm. most likely and but that uh, immaculate focus has brought you to the environs of a of a book and a film completed yeah yeah so congratulations and definitely inspired by Inspired by things you've done, which I actually uh, mention something that you were involved with at the end of that book. As a in the references, it's you know for further research. Wow! But um, incredible, incredible. Now, now I asked you before uh, if it was okay to talk about American movie because I didn't want to offend you, and it could be one of those situations where I bring it up and you say. Absolutely not. I will not talk about it. But. That, <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, we had this uh, prefatory exchange, and uh, not to digress, but I certainly will and take the bull by the horns. You have a very, very good radio voice. It's very, uh, <laughs> that dude's cracking up. That's why I'm saying you're hard to read, because <laughs> a lot of people would uh, merely say thank you and, and take it that and then you crack up so that's what makes you kind of hard to read because it's undeniable that you do have this good radio voice but then when you're recognized for it you crack up so that kind of you know that kind of you again that makes you a hard personality to read well, all right thank you <laughs> <laughs> i just i i mean here you got a professional radio guy cracking up because he's complimented so that's hey man it's 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 your show I just always thought I had a nerdy voice. No, no, no. You've got, you've got a good, solid radio voice, man. <laughs> well, let me tell you real quick. The first time that I saw American movie, a friend of mine who was an associate from Los Angeles when I lived in Florida at the time, and she was a music manager. I always wondered if she was going to like get involved with me or sign me or something or you know give me my break or whatever. And then she recommended that I go watch American movie. And I watched like 20 minutes of it and I was so angry because I thought it wasn't a real movie. And then I thought, 
somebody had made this movie making fun of me. Like I'm, I took it so personally because I was this struggling kid in Florida trying to do his thing and never getting anywhere, you know, trying to do it. I thought it was an insult somehow. Uh, do you, does that sound like a familiar thing that people say? No, I've you? never heard that before. That's pretty bizarre. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you, you talk about your, your struggling and so forth. I mean, your, your book is very uh, finely done. Your, your DVD is very finely done. Now, of course, I'm talking form over content at that point, at this point, having right. not perused uh, the, the, what's actually inside, but obviously I can tell you're a pro and so on and so forth. And so it's amazing that you say struggle, which you have done, because only you know you, but at the same time, you have also wildly succeeded because the majority of people will never, ever, even remotely get close to where you've gotten. I um, know many, many people where the, the publishing is, is not going to happen for them. Uh, a completed anything is, is just not going to happen for them. And yet you've went ahead and you've done this, you've accomplished this. Um, so again, you know, congratulations. And it's amazing because you do have the latter half of your life now waiting for you. And obviously it's going to be interesting what you do, uh, continue to do. Thank you. Uh, I'll also, you know, I'll try not to laugh there, but say no, thank please you. do, man. I, I, well, maybe, the, you know what, maybe it's some nervous recognition that you're alive, that you are accomplished, that there are contradictions along the way, and you are identifying those contradictions furtively through these uh, humorous outbursts. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, on America Movie and your life now, how does America Movie oh, no, fit no, no, into no. the, oh, we're going <laughs> my, back. No, my life now, my life is from 19... 66 everything from that date until the present time is a footnote uh there's only one since and, and that's since 1966 now dude looks all serious <laughs> i'm a little bit of a slow thinker and i'm trying to yeah but obviously along. it's paid off because uh you know you have uh, you've brought depth and texture to your life through that uh that uh, slow temporal pace you've administered to yourself. So how does the movie now fit into the context of your life? I, I see. I don't. How do you see, relate to it? The only when when something happens to someone, it doesn't change the person. It changes the people around them and mm -hmm. their reaction to you. It, I wake up at the same time. I write the same. Okay. It hasn't changed. Um, so I. Not only that, I don't uh, think like you guys do. I don't think about any media that I've been on. I don't think about any, it's not part of my life. Um, it's not a conscious choice. It's just uh, the way that my mind works. It only registers self potential and only uh, registers internal curiosity. So I always, when people come up to me, I always draw a blank because they're talking to the wrong person. I mean, you know, what they're talking about is an, an illusion, uh, a this, a that, a phantom, of, of the in the shadowy network of their own um, potentially misaligned perceptions or aligned perceptions maybe or something like that so yeah I don't I don't think that it's I'm not that uh, that's somebody else so on and so forth I mean I'm not trying to get uh, psychologically avant-garde on you so you know you as a seasoned pro will keep penetrating these uh, formidable questions you've set out to have answered. So you will certainly attempt your job and I uh, conversely will attempt mine. <laughs> Are you leaving that laughter in? I, I, maybe. <laughs> well, that's certainly an icebreaker. Okay. Impressions of LA. What did you come out here for? Uh, Sasha Gray specifically uh she flew me out for her podcast i've been out here many times before um i was talking with a friend recently he had made a film about the same time i did coven and um and i'll get back to the la thing and he goes yeah he said you know if they didn't have cameras on you or anything like that none of that would happen would have happened i said i know no doubt man and uh because it, it's all symbiotic it's all the domino effect uh uh, the documentary was made by uh, one person that spearheaded the effort, was preternaturally blessed with determination, motivation, 
a uh, high degree of intellect, high degree of life smarts, high degree of self potential, and high degree of self wherewithal. And he was uh, uh, aided by uh, many other like minded professional people who didn't mess around. And as that garnered various attention, and you had a certain um, pedigree of events that brought it to many people's attention. So had one misstep occurred in that process we wouldn't be having this conversation i would have been joe blow who had made a 37 minute film well among many other things i've done with my life and that was that so i take it all with a grain of salt and it's as fake as a three dollar bill the illusion like i said one little mis misstep in the process and we wouldn't be here so i never i never um uh, revel in the uh in that particular glory because again it's like uh, oh if you one different number on the lottery ticket it wouldn't have happened or anything or you know some people's lives have been uh, saved by not stepping off the curb at a particular moment you know so i see that is uh Again, but again, it's not luck or chance either because of the immense amount of a talented people involved and in no way, shape, or form can they be sold short in any way, shape, or form because they, they did a, a marvelous job. But again, the adulation of the uh, audience is again a uh, drive from a prescription of chance beyond the hard work that was put into it uh, the chance of winning this the chance of being financed by that you know all of those things whereas uh, so anyway yeah so success is actually real success is what you do on a daily basis and how you handle yourself and real success is how you react to the adverse adverse uh, adversarial um instrumentation of life you know that can be wrought at any time for good or ill you know it's your attitude toward things and so forth so uh, i'm not going to indulge this superficial idea of success in any way shape or form uh, i was not by luck or chance that you spearheaded your projects uh to my left you know which i'm very proud of what you've done and um you did that out of the uh immensity of your own self potential so you have uh, enjoyed true success. Thank you. You got it. <laughs> now we'll answer that LA stuff. So uh, I've been out here a lot relative to who I am. But, but I mean, when you say a lot, how, how much, how many times do you think you've been to LA? Um, maybe close to a dozen, which is tremendous for me who has otherwise no business being here. And if this wouldn't happen, I determine it upon my psychology. I may have never made it out because I don't travel. I don't think like a normal people I, person i do not op operate like a, a normal person so uh i'm as foreign as foreign can be to you guys um so but anyway specifically sasha gray has a podcast deep tissues she flew me out here so thank you sasha gray uh we extended the plane trip to do various gigs i considered it james dickey uh, barnstorm for poetry back in his day and I was barnstorming for bucks man uh, just trying to hit up some gigs to to make bills and so forth which is something normally some someone doesn't say on the radio because they're just going to give you the usual BS oh it, 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 it trust me when you go to get a job you don't go to make friends you go to get a paycheck every Friday but Eventually, you become friends with your co-workers, and that social environment does exist. But no one in their right mind has ever signed a job application to make friends. They're there to uh, uh, get rent taken care of, and then come the friendship. So when everyone comes and tells you, oh, you know, it was for this or that, number one, people are doing it for a paycheck because rent is due in America for 300 million of us. And then comes all the friendships and the glad, glad handing and the back slap, back slapping and all of that stuff. Because when you listen to it enough times, you, you I cannot myself propagate all this mythology that people bandy about. And, and people who deride LA is ridiculous. It's a there's a couple problems. The sun's shining all the time, and they, they drive too fast, which is a serious problem because, uh, uh, fortunately, not so many accidents occur here, uh, which is very surprising. So people at least are on their toes. 
Uh, it's a historical. It's a very historical city. Um, obviously, people came out here for many reasons, film-wise, to uh, flee Edison and his uh, patent situation. He had an iron grip on it till that was broken, and also to burn sun into film stock. Uh, this had perpetually good weather. Not only that, obviously, on the East Coast, all the real estate is. Uh, spoken for and out west uh, you could buy large tracts of land for next to nothing and what a great time to start setting up studios you know since the uh, motion picture industry was on the rise and at that point unstoppable so there was uh, many reasons people had uh, emigrated out here and uh, so we find ourselves here now. So it's uh, Los Angeles, and you go to downtown. That's another thing people never talk about. It's it's it's, it's beautiful milieu of uh, Art Deco I, and the uh, vis the facades of all of the forlorn and time worn and abandoned theaters down down is just incredible. So when you see Paul Schrader's The Canyons, you see the visages of all of these uh, past movie theaters at the beginning of his of the opening credits of The Canyons and. That can be reflected in real life once you start strolling downtown on Broadway and so forth here in Los Angeles. So the majority of people don't understand that there's a thriving metropolis downtown as there is in New York City. You know, you're you're, you're talking about all this other superficial stuff um, aligned with L.A. that really sometimes doesn't even, doesn't even make sense nor pertain to the person talking about it. So L.A. is a, uh, it's a very beautiful town with a lot of good people, a lot of earnest, hardworking people, a lot of very productive people. So that definitely has to be recognized. So you said your day is not like, you don't think like normal people. And so did that, did your... Um growth as a filmmaker did you were you ever thinking like hey i should get out to hollywood or something like that no it never crossed my mind and my growth as a filmmaker uh began and ended when i was about 14 instinctively i knew i'd uh cut film on the heartbeat composed there was no out of focus shots there was no ill-conceived compositions there was no no such thing as jump cuts you know i knew the 30 percent rule 180 degree rule eye line all of that stuff so my career began and ended at 14. now of course uh specifically many will point out a discrepancy of course the first few films were out of focus because i had little money i bought a super 8 camera that was permanently out of focus i think the the lens obviously was it was jarred and thereby misaligned what could i do i didn't know that until i had my first cartridge of super 8 film developed but as soon as i did have a proper working camera there was no such thing as out of i mean just out of focus wasn't going to happen not on my watch and jump cuts were not going to happen so when you look at my super 8 films uh, they're composed and edited, you know, just on the money like that. So my career began and ended, like I said, as a early to mid teen, and that was it, man. So, how'd you learn that stuff so fast at such an age? Well, it, it's instinctual. First of all, I never, I never got into movies. I thought they were. Uh, life was far more interested. I, I was grew up around an interesting group of people. I, I listened a lot. And I was in love with the language and the cadences of the syntax and so on and so forth. And I always recognized movies as being absolutely worthless and superficial. But what I did do was look at, uh, look at books on film and study the black and white stills, you know, to promote films. So it's obviously to the... Um, marketer's advantage they would be very dramatically composed so i would say man this has got to be a great film because a picture tells a thousand words and my mind was aflamed with about like ten thousand of them and that's how i came into film uh, i don't know intuitive i just i got onto orson wells and all of that stuff where the camera was actually a character and so you didn't it wasn't like the abc movie of the week where the camera was just a recorder a static recorder of events a very prosaic recorder of events but in wells the cinema the camera is a very dynamic and compelling element and so I, I just was just in love with his cinema and his uh, use of montage, that offsetting quirky nature of editing that would jar you spatially. You know, the spatiality was very disjointed in his films because of the uh, uh, the, the odd, odd com or odd uh, again spatial spatial use of where the camera was geographically placed within the scene and so forth, and you had kind of had to get used to his. Uh, is editing and uh, I'm not speci specific I'm not talking about like Citizen Kane but more like uh, maybe Mr. Arkadin and uh, Lady from Shanghai and um, 
with Stranger and Macbeth and Othello and Chimes at Midnight and some more of his uh, adventurous, uh, technically adventurous films. I mean, Citizen Kane actually was, it's great. I mean, obviously at, in the beginning with the snow globe and it, I mean, it's, it's, it's like literal art at the beginning of Citizen Kane and so on and so forth. But, uh, but did all of that attention to Kane has precluded uh, a uh, curious eye toward, again, like I say, Othello, Macbeth, Chimes at Midnight, F for Fake, The Trial, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which are, which are just fantastic films in, a, in, in and of themselves. I read a kid on the internet who was writing on a cinematography message board. His mom somehow had gotten $400,000 in a divorce and she wanted to send him to film school and give him half of her retirement money, like 200000 to go to any film school he wanted or something like that. What would you, you would you give any advice to somebody like that? Well, wait, wait a second. She offered him two hundred grand to go to film school. Yeah. Well, for I mean, his what, education, what is that, USC. I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Well, well, we're talking about a four year degree, so that's fifty thousand a year. That's a nonetheless, that's a very costly film school. I think it's a it's a beautiful act on behalf of the mother toward her son. I. I just all praises be because uh, uh, someone could get four hundred thousand bucks. It could be completely squandered. In fact, you probably could uh, end up in the red. Uh, you know, gambling debts, bad investments, uh, buying property. You're not going to be able to keep up with the mortgage and so on and so forth. So that's an incredibly compassionate and an incredibly hopeful act on her part. Um, I, I I would be very wary of. Uh, giving two hundred thousand dollars to someone unless they were their heart was actually in it, and if there was some prefatory evidence uh, that would uh, suggest that that money was going to be well invested, I'd be very, very wary and cautious of of such an investment. Now, there, I mean, your child is priceless. Uh, but but uh, you also want that a child cannot be bought and you want that child to go on the r right path. I know we're talking 20 year old or so because they're going to film school or what have you. So, again, it's a specific circumstance. I mean, if, if it was uh, the, the right thing to do, absolutely. If this person was, was really into film and that's what they were going to do with their life and this education was only going to further and um, further their career and empower their chances then absolutely would be a good idea do you go to modern mainstream movies see the go to the theater no i go i go to see a hollywood film maybe once or twice a year if that i don't even think i've been to one for for a year or so or something like that no life is too short i watch about four films a week predominantly on dvd or at the university where we get some great 35 millimeter prints i mean i've seen um Series on Ozu, uh, Bergman, just uh, uh, Strozik on uh, 35, uh, all kinds of stuff of two or three things I know about her and made in USA on 35, Symbiopsychotaxoplasm, take one on 35, uh, just um, an incredible amount of films at the university on 35 that I've been blessed by. I'm not going to waste my time in a mainstream theater, even though. What I uh, I would have liked to see in August to Osage County, which is a very odd thing to say, but I like theater and uh, written uh, by Tracy Letts. So I, I like when the stage is transferred to the screen because with a uh, common narrative film, there's the obsession where each scene must fulfill a, a narrative arc and you feel the bird and the heaviness of that conven conventional template always over your head when you're in a uh, watching a conventional movie but when um, so I prefer films by a long shot uh, John Frankenheimer's Seconds um, Jim McBride's David Holzman's Diary Punishment Park uh, etc well of course Cassavetti's Faces Opening Night A Woman Under the Influence Her Saga Gary The Wrath of God Signs of Life even Dwarves Started Small Nosferatu Strozik etc etc I mean but you can go on and on I mean, you can go, you know, again, like the Wells, Polanski, Dreyer, you know, Gertrude and Orday and uh, Vampire and The Passion of Joan of Arc and or more contemporary Paul Schrader's work. Or, I mean, there, there's so much cinema, 
you know, since publicly since 1895 uh, on up that to squander your time in, uh, uh, for uh, in populist and proletariat cinema is, is, is ridiculous, you know, for me. What, uh, what's your primary focus uh, work-wise? What are you working on lately? Well, my, my primary focus is all my, my writing assignments because I've always been, a, always been a writer, and I write for a, About Face Media. I write on documentary film and interview film directors and also um, book reviewer. Uh, in Mo- in Milwaukee for one of their papers, the Shepherd Express, and so I've always have these assignments. Do not only that, I write feature scripts, I write radio dramas, I write um, uh, poetry, I write uh, short form, all of this stuff. So I mean, I'm constantly rolling and so forth. And I think, and I and I shot a lot of film too, and I just uh, don't like sitting in front of a screen because I don't watch TV. I the only dealings with the internet is business, man. So I'm not. I don't sit around and search nothing or do nothing like that. I've zero interest. The sensuality of a book uh, is is omnipotent, and the internet means zero to me. You know, it's 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 uh, like a customized TV. I it uh, I have zero interest. It's just a it's a business thing. I got a phone. I don't even own it, man. I'm appreciative you know, of all that I have, but I have zero interest in the screen. I have zero interest in the internet or nothing like that. It's, it's gaudy. It's garish. It's fragmented there. There's no sensuality to it. You know, it's, it's just, it's mm -mm, no dice. You know, it's helpful at times. I mean, it's good to have a cell phone in the car. If you know, you can't, if your car breaks down or something like that, or you're in some situation, of course, you know, that's, that's always a great thing to have, but, um, it's just not for me even though you'll see me using it but that's like i say that's for business i don't need, i don't even own the phone man so you live where uh, uh what city oh milwaukee milwaukee do you detect a big difference between the people here and the people in milwaukee um yes and no because like with any city there they have a film industry so if i hang out with the film industry people in Milwaukee then it's just like hanging out with people here in LA because that's what they do professionally you know they come out here they go to New York all of that kind of stuff they're in the industry as well as you guys so it's it's the exact same they're 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 doing their business Uh, here there's a denser ratio of people in the uh, entertainment industry uh, more than any other city say for say New York New York City so it depends which circles you go around and uh, like I say I it would be in one way, it'd be well. There's a, there's a, you know, a, one social reason at least for staying out here. It would be that people are interested in film, but a, uh, not a good reason would be that you'd be constantly invited to events and parties and get-togethers and working on other people's films. So your individuality would be disseminated. You you would not be a standing person anymore out here. You know, especially if you're known, you'd get you'd get uh, being pulled each other way so you you'd be in 200 parts man and would never be able to reorganize yourself till you got back home so how uh, do you f- find that you've become a more peaceful person over the years uh recently yeah but that's all self-induced um you know when you you know obviously you know the pl- plasticity of the mind and you know i'd start to catch on to that how you could uh, form new r- mental routes and how you could stop thinking about some things, start thinking about others. It would be actually, it, it's, it's habit forming. It's an extreme form of compartmentalization that uh, you don't even think about the things that you've thought about before. And also stress inducing situations, you just kind of like blank out on. So, because obviously that's not good for your health, raises your blood pressure, can send bad signals around the body, and ultimately they can react in a very, very malignant way. And uh, so you want to be aware of that. Uh, so my peace has been brought about by myself. It's funny because people talk about meditation. Hey, man, you know, just sit in silence, don't think about nothing for an hour. And I'm thinking, man, what good is that going to do? You thinking around, thinking about nothing for an hour? Forget that crap. And I stand by it. I understand what they're saying. That's their gig. 
I do my own meditating, invented by myself, which thinks about productive life paths, and that pays off because and then you were, you fall back on that. You sit around and think about nothing, which 99% of the meditators do, man. It's God bless you. I, I don't, that it's just not for me, and you got to focus on something, which may be antithetical to that particular philosophy of meditation, but uh, uh all a lot of a lot of very uh, accomplished people you know they focus that means repetitive thinking repetitive joyous thinking on what you like that also is called meditation so on in general you wake up feeling a lot better these days as, as opposed to maybe 10 years ago no not particularly um uh no, because my mind is very complex and hyper analytical. So again, it's not like a normal person just wakes up with a blank or maybe one or two concerns. You know, I, 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 um, you know, track the sun and the light each day, how that affects me. That can have a very profound historical effect on me as I look back at my history, look forward to my future and how tracking uh, the sun sure tracking the sun how does that I, work well I, I have no choice um the morning is the most beautiful it's just calm it's ethereal the day has not been poisoned by the insanity of others and other circumstances you know beyond your control so uh the morning is just heaven and bliss and then the sun begins to rise and traffic increases and various things have to be accomplished so then that becomes a more of a very garish unromantic situation and i have this melancholy anxiety thing maybe two three four i'm watching that sun uh you know so on and so forth but i calm down by when evening the twilight the ethereal beauty of uh twilight begins begins to make itself known and slowly but surely uh, begins to dominate and overrule the garish nature of you know that obstinate sun do you think that would freak you out living in somewhere like san francisco then where it's always foggy that would actually affect your mood well i I like Overcast, and, and thank God in Milwaukee for filming reasons. I, I couldn't make a film out here because there's sun all the time. You'll never get uh, a, a beautiful exposure out here. I mean, it's just sun, and that's not that's not good. It was good 100 years ago to burn in, into the film stock, but when you have Overcast, continual Overcast, which we have a lot in Milwaukee, there's an even dispersal of the light disbursement of the light and which makes for very beautiful uh, uh tones upon everything which you which you can't get out here so uh to film out here would all just be a continual la story can the uh the L los angeles architecture the uh prototypical people the this the the uh, perpetual sunshine so out in los angeles los angeles stories are main and Wisconsin stories cannot be made out here. So that that's that. Each so when now you're talking about like seasonal disorder. I, I love uh, uh, you know reading and writing and and the um, moodiness of an overcast day allies itself with that particular instinct. So this perpetual sun out here, I'd go I'd go bonkers, man. Now too much overcast. Like you mentioned San Francisco, that if you're depressed, that can really affect you. And some people probably, I think, have to take medicine if there's if they live in an overcast environment, they start going nuts, man. I've experienced that a few times. It gets a little bit claustrophobic day after day. You know, it's very moody, very romantic to see those very somber skies. But if you've got stuff weighing on you, and that sunny coming back out for a long time, it starts to get freaky. Have you ever used any type of uh, SSRIs or uh, mood stabilizers, anything like that? Mm -mm. No dice. I don't even take an aspirin, man. I've had maybe a couple headaches in my life, one or two. And maybe I had a bad one or so where I took like a extra strength Tylenol. Extra strength Tylenol works. So I've maybe taken a Tylenol or an aspirin maybe two or three times in my life. That's about it. And I just, I just don't, I just don't do stuff like that. I mean, the heaviest I, I get is like coffee, man. So that's that. 
So are you, there was some drinking in America in American movie. Oh no, no, not uh, in that. Still... There was there was drinking in my life. That's that's all done with. That now that's now that's something. Now a lot of people can cannot get out of alcoholism. It just ain't going to happen. And it's it's a um, I always laugh, and it's not funny because you know, for most people, things are a physical thing. I've smoked cigarettes for years, but I laughed because I knew in my mind that I was never a smoker. So I just, after smoking, maybe whatever for years or so, I just quit, never thought twice about it. And most people can't do that with alcohol. Um, after drinking for 25 years and having a horrible alcohol problem, when I realized that it was over, I just laughed because there was no physical withdrawal or nothing because my, I was always prepared to quit because I never was that. I, when I was young, I could never understand what the wizard played by Peter Boyle and Taxi Driver was talking about where he was a cab driver, but he didn't own his own taxi cab because that wasn't what he really was. And as a younger person, I just could not figure out what the hell this guy was talking about. And he was just saying basically that it's a job, but it's not who he was. So I was never, uh, a, even though I smoked cigarettes maybe for years, I never was a cigarette smoker. So I just laughed and, and stopped smoking without z with zero withdrawal. Same with drinking. You know, people have deliriums, DTs, whatever. After 25 years hardcore, I laughed, and that was it. You know, and that was over a decade ago. No physical, nothing at all in any way, shape, or form. Why'd you decide to just stop? Oh, because uh. I wouldn't get, I knew I wasn't going to get where I wanted to get in life or even have a chance at that by drinking. That drinking was uh, a, a gr great impediment. It was an act of, it was, well, it was an act of not only self-destruction, but of escape. Obviously, it also it felt good, too. So you kind of had that triad of uh, answers, you know, that, that, that were always there. And, but again, ultimately in its abusive form is obviously a form of self-destruction and then you just say well that's enough of that and then that's that so so i'd been drinking for as much as a lot of people have been you know living on this earth you know if you're a, uh, someone in their mid-20s i i drank for the, the the entire their entire lifespan and that was that so yeah i mean drinking and addiction has its horrible consequences and the vast majority of people can never get out of it you know it's uh so but uh so they need all the help they can get you know god or aa or, or whatever you know however they can get out of it you know they need to get out of it that's that's for sure but, but my situation was so serious i could not mess around with god i could not mess around with AA. that wasn't even an option i was like dude you gotta t deal with this and deal with it now because uh, there's no cop outs, there's no attempts or nothing like that. So anyone who would come to me with that kind of stuff, that's, that's for somebody else, man. That ain't for me. You like Frank Zappa? No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, no. I I like everyone. I I just like to, uh, uh, as Nancy Reagan had pointed out, uh, just say no. Obviously, in the in the early '80s, and that's a very good thing. So I practice it. No, I I I like Frank Zappa. I like everyone now um, your question could have been bettered by being asked are you familiar with or do you enjoy his music i uh i know i never i've i never got into it i know he's extraordinarily talented in all of that stuff it, it just wasn't my scene now obviously it's yours there's no doubt about that because otherwise you wouldn't have asked it have you had an iq test yes what was the result i always remember it being 142 now, that's what I remember, and who knows what kind of IQ test, who knows what, this, that. So all I'm telling you is what I remember. So, you know, was it different? Sure. Could it have been different? Sure. Could I be mistaken? Sure. Uh, who administered it? I don't know. This, that, the other thing. That's all I remember. So don't bet the farm on it. Do you think that you're charismatic? To a degree, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that I'm not because that that would be foolish. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having a conversation here. You know, there's you're not you haven't picked Joe. You didn't drive all the way here and say, oh, I'll just find this guy sitting on the curb, man, uh, throwing a can up and down. You know, there has to be some relevance to your narrative um, to make this happen. And has that ever had any negative effects in your life? No, not at all. 
why would why would charisma have a negative effect i've always i i was the guy that always jump started your car fixed your flat helped you move all of that kind of stuff uh but i was not the guy to sit around as a normal person would at a barbecue i'd always stay 20 feet away from people and either practice the guitar or read the newspaper because i uh small talk it fries my brain cells so i I like physical activity i like uh like i say helping people out and so on and so forth but uh the 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 minutiae it's an absolute waste and i then yay what are you doing you want to go i because i would never like meet someone at a bar i would never uh just sit around with a person or that uh, unless they had something some compelling evidence that they were of interest you know if hey you know i worked with this filmmaker i know this author and it's like man tell me more that rarely happens now here obviously would happen to a greater degree because of the uh the uh, particular environment you know that that it's replete with artists and so on and so forth but see i don't when I was a kid, I was smart, man. I I loved AM radio because I loved the uh, the din of the, the 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 voices, whether it was a ball game or people talking. But I caught on that that the, the news would always come up and it was always negative. So, like like I said, when I was a kid, man, I just suddenly I just turned the radio. I said, up, oh, I won't be listening to news anymore. So I I don't watch TV. I don't anytime the news comes on, I turn it immediately off. Uh, because that all that goes into your brain it's not like you're flying around the world helping starving people you're not all you're doing is just uh getting uh a vicarious and furtive thrills through other people's misery that's the only people listen to the news uh is, is because it, it thrill you know there's there's these neural connections that get thrilled by because they're they're not the ones you know in the crash or anything like that and they feel this disassociated compassion to people yeah there there is there's no harm in being curious if you turn on the news and you know you're you're curious you obviously you're human you have every right to be curious you have every right to to listen to the news but uh but basically again it, it uh fulfills uh a visceral need or a vicarious need in people so it's like i say they're not kicking in money or donating to the poor or the helpless or people that have been harmed for the most part they're just getting their thrills so hey did you listen to the news nope i ain't that way i would see that sometimes on facebook when people would repost pictures of animals being tortured or something oh, yeah, but in a way to repost it to make people feel bad as if they're a better person by reposting it like like you were saying it's a sort of an example of that yeah yes and no because it it could be an example of that but also then when people do draw attention let's say celebrities draw attention to a cause it does actually work because it does get in the psyche all of this green environment stuff would never have happened it would have been unthinkable 20 years ago there's just no way people would have bought into this mass uh, exodus away from from polluting and so on actually it's this is now the um, capstone of postmodernism. When I, I can remember when postmodernism started to kick in back in the early 70s with the Native American, uh, with the tear rolling down his eye because of pollution. And you know, it, uh, the way I see it, you know, modernism may have started about a hundred years ago when we left the uh, Victorian, the Edwardian age of wood and so on, and the, that the Victorian gaslight and then electricity came in, and Art Deco replaced realism and impressionism, and um, then utilitarian stuff started coming in, and then postmodernism to me is when we realized all the harm that these devices were causing, like the car, like the factory, and all of this stuff, and now there's this uh, massive reaction against against uh modernism and it's called organic (laughs) oh man i feel bad that i don't know anything about what's happened with uh mike shank mike shank right well why should you feel bad there's seven billion people to concern (laughs) yourself with i mean you know to be fair to everyone you know some people are doing good some people are not doing as well as with in the tapestry of anyone's labyrinth of friendships and uh, colleagues and so on and so forth and you know he had to happen to uh, have a very uh, docile personality and there were very lonely times when you do artistic endeavors 
because you have this when you when you work at a job you you put in circles in the circles squares in the squares now some people do have conceptual work where they have to actually use their brain power and figure things out you might be a graphic designer you might might be even have to roll the dice on investments uh, or a market uh, strategist and so on strategists and so on and so forth and uh, there are those things and there's other uh, a lot of people that oh man I go to work and work hard you know they're they're just doing you know, I've worked in factories, and, and you know, uh, uh, that, that just uh, uh, primate could do that stuff, you know. it's uh, But brain power, man, that's where the psychological stress really comes in. You know, doing, I've worked on the farm, the factory, the military, all of that stuff. That's just manual labor, man. That's is, is, right to write or uh, conceptually conceive of things as, as far greater work but you know the, the brutes will always defend oh i'm all digging a ditch well, i'll dig a ditch with you dude i've dug ditches too no sweat man that's just physical labor but uh, brain work is far more uh, uh far more of a, a burdensome task than, than physical stuff like i say that's just animal stuff well what i should have said is i i didn't do any research or preparation before meeting with you why should you so i was going to ask <laughs> no, you've done fine man what you, uh what's going on with mike shank and I, how did i don't know I ask two him. questions there <laughs> are you still in contact well i'm in contact with lots of people i'm not going to be objectified or categorized or pigeonholed or anything you know i've i have uh had many many friendships uh, throughout my particular span of life and so on and so forth and uh, like i said he's doing well uh, there's other people that are not doing as well. Some people do, ain't even walking the earth no more, while others are. So that's why I was very brightened, and I'm very empowered by what you've given me and what you've done. And and one of the things is, now here's the problem. Now, I can be very excited by your efforts and your accomplishments. But the fact is, when I step back out on that street, you're going to fade off into the sunset. Now, I will read your book, and I will look at the film uh, then seeps in the minutia of the everyday that constant and never-ending attrition of the soul and individuality and the very prosaic you know so are you saying that you are the high-powered always rolling person and i'm the minutia or no no actually just that? the op well no ne neither of us no how the hell could you be the minutia when you just handed me this book in this film you're the guy who is empowering it's when you step outside and encounter the minutia of the of the everyday much which is avoidable you know strained relationships uh people's off-track ideas how could you ever include yourself into that my dear friend i wonder see, if that's, that's again, what you now, were... see that's another again you have that quirky unpredictable sensibility out of you after i explain all of that sing your praises you throw yourself into the fray of the uh uh the the bottom echelon of the rung which well you said when not. you said when you walked out in the street then yeah. I, I would fade into minutia yeah, you no no you would fade away from me and i would be left with your book your film which would be the visages the the, uh, the remnants of your great deeds but the next people that i encounter are not going to be handing me a book they're not going to be handing me a film they're going to be handing me you know the everyday like i said that slow silent but uh persuasive attrition of the soul so do you try to surround yourself with those influences insulate yourself like you were talking about well you know that's really hard um because if you surround yourself with filmmakers they're going to want you to work on their films that ain't going to help you out for nothing except momentarily expire inspire you uh so on and so forth people are in it for themselves but other people as well but they also form communities like frankie latina in milwaukee is doing a second film feature film snapshot it breaks my heart that he's getting ready to wrap it up because he has formed every time we film he forms a community of all of these hard-working friends and so on and so forth and I just really delight in the energy when I'm on set with him because I've encountered other situations where it's just a bunch of goofballs or there's enough goofball, goofballs that populate the premise where it kind of like distracts from the intent of filmmaking and they're talking about everything else and uh, you know it took me a while to catch on to that so I, I um I, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's a crapshoot. Uh, I mean, unless you have paid employees, 
uh, or unless you're doing something collectively that you have uh, singular ambitions with, you know, it's hard to surround yourself with uh, supportive people. Again, you know, because it's so, the human persona is so erratic. Now, if I've got a budget and I'm paying 40 people to work on the film, well, they're going to want to get paid, so they're going to be, they want to be in lockstep with what's going on, you know, or, or they're out the door. So then again, you have this singular trajectory, which is helpful to all. But when you just have a loose assemblage of people, as you do in everyday life, life uh you each and every day you gotta like i say fight for your singularity and your own particular vision and you just gotta like nancy reagan say you just gotta do say a lot of no all the time no 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 so that's why i jumped on you with that frank zappa thing and oh, of course he's a beautiful person with beautiful music did i in particular listen to him no i didn't what's your struggle these days <laughs> The struggle is always with self. The, the outside world is, you know, everyone's born on a different track. You know, some it's their main mission to have this complete misery and friction with the outside world and have every excuse in the, the world not to succeed, you know. And I blame myself 100% for everything. Any error, misstep, wrong path taken, you, I look right at me. So my struggle is with me, and me is comprised of my... Uh, experiences, my hopes that have been achieved, my hopes that have not been achieved, uh, my every move, so on and so forth. So actually, it's beautiful you talk about my struggle because I think I am going to maybe potentially tackle um, uh, the uh, six-volume set, My Struggle, which is going to be like 3,500 pages. I, you, there's a discernible look of inf unfamiliarity that has now been painted on your face i'm wondering my struggle if it's, i know it's, it's, yeah what you, it is what, yeah. it, what is it oh it's um i believe he's norwegian and he's an author uh, potentially in his mid 40s who is kind of writing and i might be wrong in every point uh six volume kind of like proust man uh swan uh uh, his multi-volume set in, in, ingratiated with details of life and so forth. Well, this is now done in the uh, contemporary, in a contemporary atmosphere, and it's called in English "My Struggle." And I think ultimately it's a six-volume set, um, and right now three volumes are out. And like I say, ultimately it'll be a 3,500-page tome all together and I'm, I'm thinking about and it's I think it's struggles of day-to-day -day life you know whatever those may be but it it's gotten enough publicity and it seems deep enough and seems um, intellectually compelling enough and socially rewarding and to say I'm reading that man to uh, give it a shot you know because again a lot of things that we do are for superficial reading for reasons and I do judge a book by its cover which you're not supposed to do but there is some merit to judging the book by its cover and we do that all the time if we didn't do that there would be no such thing as advertising there would be no such thing as a u.s economy and so on and so forth so you got to kind of get to that uber intellect where you begin to admit your superficialities as an actual uh, substantive portion of life i think we have one, i have one more question then we have to wrap it up unfortunately and i didn't feel like this is the best last question but have you read any ayn rand oh um atlas shrugged that actually i have to um find a larger trade paperback of it because i'm not gonna um you know get a little bit larger print you know it's a dense yeah dense volume and actually um i have a rare book of hers and uh, something to do with uh selfishness by her so i got that sitting there so no as of yet i haven't um i have uh, saw I, I will read atlas shrugged and there is the uh, uh, obscure film uh based on her book concerning the architect what is that which is that the fountainhead the fountainhead correct so the fountainhead and atlas shrugged i mean i read a lot uh, whether it's Updike and Shiver or Dickey or Carver or Thompson or Bukowski or Henry James or Joseph Conrad, et cetera, et cetera. It's, and, of course, the noir greats here in L.A., uh, uh, Raymond Chandler, Ross McDonald, Donald, Dashiell Hammett. Uh, you know, you can just throw in Shakespeare. You can throw in the great playwrights. And, I mean, et cetera. I mean, you can go back to Selene and, and uh, Balzac and... Proust and I mean however Baudelaire however you know 
it's uh, whatever bohemian death defying you want to get and so on and so forth i mean it's endless I mean, we, we could start we could run names for the next couple hours dude you might want to start with anthem if you haven't read it by ayn rand no i have i've because um, that's like a 45 minute read it's really cool wait by whom by ayn rand ah anthem. I, want, I may have it i i have a lot i have thousands and thousands and thousands of books and uh uh and i know you said it's the last question i'm uh, right in the middle of uh, Nexus, Sexus, and Plexus. So I'm right in the middle of the of the of the second volume, and but I think summer is a great time for Joseph Conrad. Uh, the, the density and the mystery of his language is, is just reeks of summer, along with the, the, our, our great noir classics and so on and so forth. And I'm actually well, I'm, I read about 60, 70, 80 books at a time, and one of them is uh, Werner Herzog's journal on Fitzcarraldo, Conquest of the Useless, uh, just another great summer journal. Herzog said L.A. I think he said L.A. was the creative capital of the world. Sure. You agree with that? Sure. Why wouldn't it be? I mean, this is the, the nexus for uh, creativity. And not only crass commercialism, crass sexuality, but also just down home, you know, hey, creative types. Well, we have to stop on that because it's 8.15. Hey, thanks a million, Carl, for having me. And thank you for allowing me to be a, um, just to be invigorated by this talk. It was nice, man. Bye. <laughs>